Hello everyone, welcome to the Brain Attack music channel. The topic for this particular video is sensory overload and overstimulation, which is a major issue for many brain injury survivors. Um, please click on subscribe to subscribe to the channel and also the bell icon uh, to get further notifications of new videos as and when they're posted. And if anyone's interested, this is what I will be doing this weekend. Sensory overload and overstimulation. No idea what this was, but I learned. The first time I came across it was in the neurosurgery ward after my stroke and brain surgery. And it dawned on me that I'm in hospital, I'm recovering from major surgery, what am I going to do? Oh, got my iPod. I've got loads of stuff on there that I could listen to that either maybe I've not listened to for years or maybe I haven't listened to yet. One of the downsides of earning your living as a working musician is that you spend most of your time, from a teaching point of view, learning your material that you're going to teach to your students and helping them get through their grades and their assessments and all the rest of it, but you're, you're listening to, to music, you're listening to them play, you're helping them out. When you're playing yourself, you're learning songs that you need to learn to play in the band that you're playing in or you're practicing. So there's music going on the whole time. So when you have some downtime, one of the last things you feel like doing is, is listening to any music because you've just had it. But there I was sitting in hospital thinking, do you know what? I could listen to a lot of music now. This is fantastic. So my wife visited me. She bless her. She did every every single day. And I said to her, look, honey, could you maybe bring in tomorrow my iPod? It's such situated in such and such a place and, you know, charge it up, blah, 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 blah. And bring my headphones in. That, that would just be fantastic. So very excited about this. I was the next day she arrived with my iPod fully charged and the charger. She brought that in as well, bless her, and headphones. Oh, fantastic. So after she left, well, right, let's let's see what we've got. So I got the iPod out and I started scrolling through and uh, found, yes, Close to the Edge, one of my all time favorite albums. Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Brain Salad Surgery, Big Big Train, English Electric. Yeah, they're all a bit, they're great, fantastic albums, but quite complicated music. There's a lot to listen to that might be a bit challenging. Marillion, Script for a Jester's Tear, that might be a little bit better. Genesis, Foxtrot. Yeah, that's got some legs, but again, they're not as complicated as the initial ones, but they're fairly complicated. I don't know. Talking heads. Remaining light. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. That's right. I, I think I need something a bit, a bit calmer. So it's a toss up between this guy, Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. But I plumped in the end for Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. For the simple reason, it's fairly calm, fairly easy to listen to from a, from a technical point of view. But it's a fantastic album. I played in a Pink Floyd tribute band, so I know the, the, the music really well. And I could listen to it and maybe reminisce about my time playing some of the stuff. So I put it on started to listen to it. I got probably about two minutes in before I can't listen to this. This is this is doing my head this is this is causing a headache. This is screeching racket. Of course it isn't, but it was to me then. And it didn't sound anything like I remembered the music sounding like. It was unbearable. And 
that was it. My my brain was fried, so turned everything off and tried to go to sleep. So the next day, I thought, well, I just, I, you know, I've still got a load of stuff on my iPod to listen to. What 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 could I listen to? And I was scrolling through and looking at oh, maybe something acoustic. Um, Henry Girls or The Unthanks or Emily Barker and the Red Clay Halo, these sorts of things. None of them really appealed. And I thought, oh, I know, classical. Can't go wrong with a bit of classical. Tchaikovsky, a little bit kind of here and there. Beethoven, maybe. Rachmaninoff, no, some of that's a bit... Uh... So, again, I eventually settled on this guy. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. String quartet. That'll be good. Only four instruments. Put that on. A couple of minutes later, the same thing happened. I could not, it was a screeching god awful racket. It was like somebody running their nails down a blackboard, a chalkboard, for those of you old enough to remember those. It was just awful. And I thought, what? I don't understand what's going on. That I can't I can't listen to music. What on earth is going on? This is, this is, this is madness. So let's draw a little parallel analogy, if you will. And let's say we have a, an internet connection and it's super fast broadband. It's fiber optic, whatever it's 40, 50 megabits per second. It's, it's top of the range. And that's our normal brain. That's our pre-injury, pre-brain injury brain. Super fast broadband. It's able to do multiple things in parallel at the same time because it has the bandwidth to have a video coming down, a conference call alongside it, somebody else in another part of the house watching another video, and at the same time sending and receiving emails. The bandwidth is there for all of this stuff to happen at the same time. Now imagine we switch over and we're using our computer on a dial-up modem. Some of you may not be old enough to remember those. So we go from 40 megabits per second to 50k, 36k, something like that. So the bandwidth reduces right the way down and we can't even watch one streaming video. It's just bit it and it all me and cut out and cut here. That is the brain injury world. All of this capacity, this bandwidth, has shrunk down, and so processing a lot of information, processing a lot of data is tricky. It slows everything down, like using a dial-up modem to stream a video compared to super fast broadband. So for brain injury survivors watching this, I guess some of you will be going, yeah, absolutely Andy, that's it. For family members, friends watching, they'll be going, crikey, ooh, I hadn't looked at it like that. that explains quite a few things in his or her, the survivor's, behaviour. So that's very much what it's like. It's tricky to process a lot of stuff. And that's, I guess, for two main reasons. One is with the injury to the brain and kind of the aftershocks of that, then the filters that we normally have that subconsciously just stuff gets tuned out so we can't really hear it or see it or sense it and we're left with the primary things we need to navigate our way through the world those filters quite often have gone with the brain injury so everything is there everything's alive the sights the sounds the smells the colors the noises, the whole lot, whoosh, it's all there. And the subconscious mind's ability to switch some of them off, so we only focus on the core ones, is no longer there. They're all, it, everything is turned on. 
to quote Spinal Tap, everything goes up to 11. So that's, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that maybe the bit of the brain that is actually doing the kind of super fast broadband bit, maybe that part of that has been affected by the brain injury. And so the brain is having to do route arounds, work arounds. It's having to find other pathways to route the signals in order for the thing to happen, whatever that is, whether that's moving a hand, moving a the other hand, moving a foot, moving a leg, processing information in the brain, whatever, it's having to go a different way and that way is not as familiar and not as quick, not, a, not, not such a well-trodden path as the way that we were doing it pre-brain injury. So it's like if you do a commute in your car and you drive the regular route day in, day out, to and from work, to and from work, very often I know this has happened to me in the past. Very often you can get somewhere and go, oh, crikey, we're here already. I didn't think, I don't remember going past the other two junctions on the, on, oh, crikey. Because subconsciously it's all been happening. We've still been aware of what's going on, but the brain's been doing it for us. And then when we change that and we go a different route, it takes a bit longer because it's not as familiar. We may take a couple of wrong turnings and we may question Ooh, am I in the right place? Is this? But it, it's all a lot less obvious than it was when we've been doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And this will link on to another video, which I'll do, about neuroplasticity and what exactly that is. To me, it's learning, it's practice. But anyway, that's that's a topic for another video. So the the new route is slower and more difficult and more challenging until we've done it multiple times and each time we do it it gets a bit easier and it gets a bit easier and then that route the new one over time becomes as comfortable and as familiar as the old one well halfway between there is where we are with brain injury we've lost the ability to navigate the old route and we're struggling to navigate the new route and all that entails all the turnings all the waypoints we're struggling to navigate that and only by doing things again and again and again and again and again will they become a bit more easy because there's no guarantees with this of course it, so some of these things may may have gone but the more we do them the better we'll get at them theoretically so there's an element of that going on as well so the second time I came across this phenomenon of, uh, of sensory overload or possibly overstimulation is another term to use, um, would be on my first home physio visit. So fresh out of hospital and I had maybe half a dozen or so visits at home from a physiotherapist until I started work at the Oxford Centre for Enablement. And uh, physio turns up okay we're gonna we're gonna do some exercises here and where we were living at the time we had quite a long single story uh, living and we had quite a long corridor from our lounge that went down to the bedrooms so she said well this is this is ideal because we can get you we can get you walking up and down here I said okay fine so she put some little cones down the middle of the corridor and got me to try and maneuver weave around them which was difficult to say the least so we did that a few times up and down the corridor she then took the cones out of the way and said right so I've noticed that when you walk you kind of stare fixedly ahead of you as to where you're as to where you're walking you don't actually look at where you're walking she said so what I'd like you to do now is is just do what you would normally do just walk down the corridor and when I tell you to took le look left look left Is that it? She said, yeah, that's it. Well, okay, fine. So I was at one end of the corridor. She's at the other. Okay, Andy, start walking. So I start walking down. She looked left. I said, okay. Plunged head first. <laughs> Plunged head first into the wall to my left. It's like, hey, what is going on? 
So she said, when you when you go out and about, she said, you need to practice this. She said, because normally when we're walking out and about, we're we're looking around, we're looking up, we're looking to one side. She said, but you can't do that. She said, and that's quite common with what, with what you've gone through. She said, you'll need to, st if you want to look right and you're walking, pre-stroke, you'd have kept walking, looked to your right and kept walking. She said, now it's too much for your brain to process. So what? you need to do is you're walking along, you need to look to the right, you need to stop, look to the right to what you're looking at, come back and then carry on again. Oh, okay. And I didn't at that time put two and two together and twig this is what the issue with was, well, this, this is what the issue was with listening to music. Okay, so what I used to do then was when we went to the hospital or when we went to the Oxford Centre for Enablement, I would actually practice that because it's nice level surface normally in these places, nice level corridors. And I would walk along and look at signs and pictures on the walls as, as we would walk by. And I couldn't do it. I could not continue walking in a straight line whilst even glancing to my right or to my left. I, it, it, I would just all over the place. So I learned to do exactly what she told me, which was to stop and turn, read the sign, come back, carry on walking. It's not an easy thing to do because you're now have something that you've done for all of your life, in my case, at that time, 55 years, you, you're you used to doing something. It, you don't even think about it. You, you do it automatically. Now you've got to consciously think about it. You've actually got to say to yourself, right, I need to stop here. And now I need to turn and look. And now it's no good moving again. I need to turn back and now focus on where I need to move. So everything becomes a very conscious, deliberate movement in order to slow everything down, slow in all the inputs, the sensory inputs to your brain down so that your brain can actually process them and cope with them. And that took a while to do that. I don't know if any of you have tried using a walking stick, but that's that was a similar exercise in as much that the natural tendency, because I would go to the left, I would try and walk to the right so I'm putting all my weight on my right side to prevent me going to the left so that was my natural side for my walking stick and it sounds bizarre I, you think I need more support on the left but because I, <laughs> the, the force was pulling me to the left I would be over to the right and that's that's kind of what I was leaning on but the idea is that you move the stick in conjunction with your left leg so when your left leg's moving forward your stick needs to move forward and then your right leg moves forward and then the, and then your right leg moves forward and then so it's kind of counterintuitive well, I found it anyway counterintuitive and I had to I had to uh, probably a good six months or so of really thinking about walking and I'd have to check myself when I started walking say right okay right arm forward left leg forward right away we go so when you move from something that you do subconsciously and have done for years and years and years without thinking and all of a sudden you've got to think about it. It, it it's a it's a very strange very bizarre experience but it works because what you're doing is taking a lot of sensory input away from the brain your brain's not having to think about walking and looking it's one you're either walking or you stopped and now you're looking so you're reducing the inputs to the brain so the brain has less processing to do it's like if you used a less uh, powerful processor on your computer normally maybe on your computer you've got half a dozen windows open and you're flipping between programs and all the rest of it but on a slower computer you can't do that you can maybe have two two programs open two windows open and you can flip between and that's that's probably it any more than that and the computer starts going ah oh, this is too much mate i don't know what you're trying to do here you're confusing me and that's, that's very much very similar to uh, sensory overload. 
The other thing that I started to notice with regard to overstimulation, sensory overload, was struggling with words. And this was a bit bizarre and probably quite unique to me, I suspect, in as much that when when the neuro fatigue kicked in, when I was struggling, when my brain had been overstimulated and was just saying, I can't talk to the hand because I can't, I can't do any more of this. What would happen is one of two things, which is either I would start using words that rhymed with, with the word that I was trying to find. Yeah. Um, years of writing lyrics, I suppose, and thinking of rhyme. I don't know. Um, or the other thing that would happen is that the word I would use would start with the same letter as the word that I was trying to find. So an example of the first one, the first time this happened was actually in hospital and I'm, I'm in the neurosurgery ward and I'm chatting to the other three guys. Um, as I may have said on another video, <clears throat> guy to my right had a, a hemorrhage bleed in the brain. A guy opposite me had a, an inoperable brain tumour, had three months to live. And I'm not too sure about the guy over in the corner because he didn't really contribute too much, bless him. But we were all chatting one day and I said, you know, I said, the thing is, because we were sort of sharing stories about our own symptoms and our own situations. I said, the thing is, I said, you know, we've all been decapitated. Which I, ironically was probably actually not far from the truth. What I wanted to say was, the thing is, we're all being incapacitated. <laughs> but instead, I said, decapitated. And I noticed this as a pattern then, as, as, as time wore on, that I would, as I say, I'd either find a word that rhymed with the word that I was trying to find, or would start with the same letter. So it kind of renders the sentence quite often a little bit nonsensical, but quite amusing as well. And I'm sure you've all got your own tells. It's kind of like playing cards, you know, playing poker. Well, what's his tell? Oh, he's, he, you know, he does this or his eyes widen slightly or whatever. It means he's got a good hand, bad hand, you know, whatever. But it's a kind of our own tell as to, oh yeah, actually I'm flagging a bit here because I'm now, in my case, I'm now rhyming <laughs> with the word that I was trying to find or alternatively made a complete word up, but it starts with the same letter as the word that I was trying to find. And then you're in that whole, oh, what was that? Oh, yeah, hold on a minute. It's, um, oh. and it won't come, but that's the sign for me anyway, to like this, I need to quit this conversation now. I need to take myself away. Maybe I need to lie down. Maybe I need to just go somewhere on my own and close my eyes and regroup. The unknown here is how long it takes to regroup. Might be an hour, might be several hours, might be a few days. So again, for friends and family members of brain injury survivors, you just have to be patient. You, you, you can't rush this. Yes, of course, your loved one, the survivor can work. They can put a lot of work in, but they also need a lot of rest. So there's a balance to be had. And this sensory overload would go hand in hand with overstimulation. So in other words, when from my personal point of view, when I was overstimulated, when my brain had been overstimulated. So maybe I, I'd had a visit from some of my kids. Maybe we'd had them round to dinner or lunch, or maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, I've, I've gone out for lunch to the pub with my wife. Maybe I've had a physiotherapy session. Maybe I've had a physiotherapy session one day and a psychology session the next day whatever it would be something where i it would be too much for me 
and my brain would be overstimulated. It couldn't cope with all the sensory input it was having. And it would just shut down. Then I would have what I subsequently called my zombie days. When I wasn't really capable of doing very much at all, physically or mentally. And over time, it gets a bit better, it gets a bit easier. But I still now, seven and a half years on, if I, I have to plan what's happening fairly scientifically. So if I have a, an appointment or a medical appointment for something, then I'll leave two days before that empty in the diary and two days after that empty in the diary. So I don't overtax myself before the appointment and I leave time for myself to recover after the appointment. A few days ago, it was my youngest son's 30th birthday and we went out and had a meal late, late lunch, early dinner as, um, with, with him and his wife. We were only in the restaurant for a couple of hours, hadn't seen them for a while. Lovely to see them. But I paid the price the next day because it was just it was just too much for me just all the noise and the conversation and the banter and the toing and froing of social intercourse and all the rest of it was just it was just too much so I kept two days before the dinner date free two days afterwards in order to make sure that I could get through the event and recover afterwards and I made that mistake in the past of putting too much in the diary or your OT here and then the physio here and too much and I ended up then having to phone up and say sorry I can't I'm not well today I can't you know and then you muck people about and then you find that you're going down the, the, the list of priorities for them and all the rest of it which is fair enough because they have they have their diaries to manage as well but it's just it's just something to be aware of that it is easy to overdo it, particularly in the early days. Part of that is we haven't yet accepted and worked out what's gone on. So my my mode of operation, modus operandi, for I would suspect probably a good couple of years following my stroke and brain injury was my default position, which it had been for the previous 55 years, which is I'm fine, I can do it, I can keep going. Yep, I'm tough, I'm solid, I'm there, I'm yep, push on through. And so I would have peaks, bursts of activity, and then I'd fall off a cliff. Then I'd have a peak of activity, and then I'd fall off the cliff. And I'd maybe fall off the cliff for a few days, a week, depending on how much of an effort I'd put into getting up the hill. So my uh, existence was very much a sawtooth wave for all synthesists out there we know a good sawtooth wave when we see one don't we and that I learned over time then to sort of that became then more of a sine wave it kind of a bit more gentle not quite so aggressive again all good synthesists out there will know about sine waves and then the sine waves become less less amplitude. They flatten out as you learn over time to basically work within your parameters. Little tip for you, a mechanical wind up clockwork timer. Normally use them in the kitchen, it's like boiling an egg, set it for four minutes whatever so my wife said to me why don't you use the timer on the fridge set it for 15 minutes because I think that's about your limit set it for 15 minutes and when 15 minutes has gone the timer rings and whatever it is you're doing and wherever you are and however far through you are what it is you're doing you're on the computer you're you're reading whatever it is stop because the bell has gone off great idea Sweetheart, thank you. I'll, I'll do that. Of course, what happens is 
it goes off after 15 minutes and you think, well, I feel okay. I'll just do another five, set it for five. It goes off five minutes later, still feel okay. Give you another five. Bell goes off five minutes later. Another, another, another half an hour, do another five, that's fine. Bell goes off. I'm struggling a bit, but I think I can do another five, set it for five. So the 15 minutes has now become 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. And then you go, yeah, I can't, I can't do any more. Um, that's, that's me done. But the problem is you've, <laughs> this is where this sawtooth wave comes in. You've now, that's it. And you're gone. And you may be gone for a day, a couple of days, a few days or whatever. So this timer helped me move from this kind of bipolar, we're all, we're all good, oh my God, the world has ended. Yeah, I can do stuff. Um, helped me move from that existence to a more... And what it means is you don't, you, you know, you've got to really rein yourself back because you feel like you can do stuff, which you maybe can, but boy, oh boy, you then pay the price for it. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth me doing all this stuff, and putting all this effort in to then spend the next few days in bed unable to move? Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe that's how you want to, that's how you want to live. Maybe that, maybe that's fine. I, you know, each to their own. But I, I found it incredibly difficult to do that. So for me, it was learning is that line from Dirty Harry? A man must know his limitations. You've got to know even things out. And it's you just feel really stupid setting the timer for 15 minutes and the bell goes off and you go, okay, fine. Even though you feel okay. But what it means is that you can do stuff in little 15-minute segments, sit down for an hour afterwards, then maybe have another little go at 15 minutes at it then rest for another hour or two. And you can actually get more done that way because you're not going like this. It's a bit more, it's a bit more level. But it takes an awful long time, took me an awful long time anyway, to actually, I don't need the timer now because I've learned through bitter experience. You start off, I did anyway, using the timer. Yep, learn, yep, get there, yep, fine. I don't need to use the timer, I'm fine. Don't need to use the timer now doing away doing something and realize you spent 40 minutes doing it and it's like oh i'm gonna pay for this and you do so oh, i need to go back use the timer again okay fine use the time and eventually you get to the stage where you've trained yourself and you get to know your tells as i was saying earlier you get to know the little signs is like oh i stumbled a bit when i move from point a to point b that's that's a tell for me I'm now stumbling over my words a bit. I'm rhyming. I'm using words that start with the same letter. Okay. What does that? What has that happened in the past, mate? What's happened when you've done? Yeah, I've overdone it, haven't I? Yeah, you have. Probably best to stop, then, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair point. So you you, you learn over time. So any way you can find set an alarm on your on your mobile whatever, any way that you can find to moderate your behaviour, level it off a wee bit as opposed to peaks and troughs the whole time, that will be hugely, hugely beneficial. And hopefully you won't learn the way that I learned through mistakes, basically, because it takes an awful lot longer to learn that way. And if you're a stubborn SOB like I am, it takes you even longer because you keep saying to yourself, no, 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 I'll be all right next time. Next time this won't happen. Next time it happens. Give you, but next time I'll be fine. And you're not. Eventually, it's a bit like, you know, getting hit over the head with a hammer. Eventually you go, yeah, actually this hurts. It didn't the first 300 times, but it's starting to hurt now. And it's also starting to get boring. So hopefully that has given you a few insights into overstimulation, sensory overload, and a few little techniques, tips 
on ways to avoid it happening. So all the very best to you. Click on the subscribe below and the bell notification icon and we'll see you soon. www.brainattackmusic.com Cheers for now. Bye-bye.